Coming up on Tech News Today, Microsoft announces tablet prices. Apple announces that they're going to have an announcement. And RIM announces a new place for developers to hang out. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, October 16th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by ShareFile. Enhance your workflow, send files of almost any size easily and securely with ShareFile by Citrix. Try ShareFile today. For a 30-day free trial, go to ShareFile.com, click the radio microphone, and enter TNT. And by Ford, featuring available sync. Now you can control your media player with simple voice commands. Enjoy your drive while you easily search and listen to your favorite songs. Check it out on the 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your iPhone, iPad, MacBook, or Android smartphones. Find out what your gadget is worth and get cash to upgrade to the latest iPhone at Gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zachter. And I'm Jason Owl. And this is the show where we keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, starting each time with the top 10 stories of the day. We call it the News Fuse. After an inadvertent early reveal this morning on the Microsoft Online Store, the price of the Microsoft Surface RT is now official and pre-orders are being taken right now. The base 10.6-inch tablet with 32 gigabytes of storage sells for $499, $599 if you want the touch cover bundled in. The 64-gigabyte version sells for $599 or $699 with the touch cover. And sold separately, the touch cover runs you $120, or you can get that more keyboard-like type cover that runs you $130. European regulators are criticizing Google's latest privacy policy, saying that there should be clearer information about how Google uses consumer data and gives users more control over their personal information. Regulators in the U.S. and Europe are also preparing for possible antitrust cases against the company after Google folded 60 of its services under a single policy. The latest investigation was led by French data protection agency CNIL. After being leaked, the boxy TV got official today. For $99, you'll get a set-top box with dual tuners, and a DVR that records to the cloud. It'll cost you 15 bucks a month to have unlimited DVR storage, and that will also allow you to view your recordings on other devices. The cloud DVR functionality will be available, available in limited markets at launch in November. Apple has invited the press to an announcement next Tuesday, October 23rd at 10 a.m. Pacific time at the California Theater in San Jose. The invitation shows a partial image of an Apple logo against a... I don't know, like as a pointillist background or something. Uh, it reads, we've got a little more to show you. What could it a mean? A little? Guess. They said a little. A oh, small. Oh. oh, my God. It's called iPad Little. It's the <laughs> Shuffle Nano. It's the <laughs> Lil Pad. Oh, my gosh. I was just about to. Oh, the Lil Pad. Dang. I like it. Beat me to it. <laughs> uh, in other Apple news, an unnamed source is passing on information that Apple customers might soon be able to pay for store items with the Passbook app. How? Well, by updating the EasyPay software used by store employees to scan Passbook-enabled Apple Store gift cards. The update would let iPhone and iPod Touch owners with Passbook pay for items using payment card codes. Apple has reportedly just finished replacing the cases on the EasyPay-equipped iPod Touch units used by store staffers in order to allow access to the rear camera. RIM opened up its first developer center in Slough in the United Kingdom. The the BlackBerry Tech Center will give BlackBerry 10 developers access to help in workspaces to build apps. Each day, the center will focus on a different part of app development. RIM will also open up more centers in Vancouver and Silicon Valley. Foxconn Technology Group, most famous as the maker of the iPhone, announced it discovered underage interns as young as 14 years old working at one of its factories. The company was investigating its factory in Yantai, China, and sent the interns back to their schools. China's minimum working age is 16. Samsung has finalized details about its lineup of Windows 8 PCs and tablet hybrids. Probably uh, what's getting the most attention is the hybrid laptop tablets, uh, the ATIV Smart PC Pro 700T that's going to run you $1,200, with a 
Smart PC 500T, that 750 with a keyboard, 650 without. Uh, plus some Ultrabooks, a note, uh, notebook, and then a couple all-in-ones. Uh, Series 5 all-in-one will run you $800, 21.5-inch screen. Series 7 all-in-one, $1,700 for a 27-inch screen or 1100 for the 23.6. And Asus unveiled the Padphone 2, the sequel to the Padphone. It's Padme. an Android phone sporting a 4.7-inch 720 IPS display, 1.5 gigahertz Snapdragon S4, and 2 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, of course, what makes it a pad phone is the tablet dock, which is now thinner, 10.1-inch 1280x800 display, only a 5,000 milliamp hour battery, down from 6,600, but the handset has better battery life at 2140 milliamp hours. Both the dock and the handset are going to be available by the end of the year in Europe and Asia. Euro pricing set at 899 euros for the 64 gig and 799 euros for the 32 gig. It's finally officially here. The Xbox Live dashboard update is now rolling out after being in public beta since July. So people have had this for a while. There's a bunch of feature updates, IE on Xbox, web video results, now includes YouTube content. TV and movies is combined into one channel, and the Sports Hub is added to the home channel of the dashboard. Oh, yeah, they've uh, also added some performance improvements, too. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Citrix and ShareFile. Technology's changed the way we work, but in order to make the most of it, you need the right tools. You got somebody who wants to fax you something? Or you want to send them a file? How do you do it? Do you got to go down to the local store and scan it in and then mail a U.S.? No, no, that's crazy. I use ShareFile by Citrix. Makes everything so much easier. Industry professionals in law, accounting, financial services, healthcare, marketing rely on ShareFile every day to collaborate with clients and coworkers while maintaining the highest level of security and accountability. I mean, sure, you could throw files up anywhere on the internet, but how do you know that they're secure? How do you know that only the people that need to see them see them? And how do you know they actually saw them? Get no bounce backs or, or inbox space problems when you use ShareFile. The way I do it, uh, I upload a file. Let's say I've got a contract I need somebody to review. I put it up on ShareFile. I limit it to just that person. I give them a special login. I send them. They get a link. They click on the link. They download the file. And then I know that they've seen it. I'm like, okay, he, he got he got that contract. He got to look at it. Uh, with ShareFile, you can access your files from anywhere, too. Your laptop, your tablet, your smartphone. I uh, want you to try ShareFile with our special offer. Sign up today and receive a 30-day free trial. Go to sharefile.com, click on the radio microphone, and enter TNT. Remember, visit sharefile.com and type in TNT. We thank Citrix and Sharefile for their support of Tech News Today. Join us again uh, very early in the morning in Australia. We're very happy to have Peter Wells from macdoc.com.au. How's it going, Peter? I'm very well, Tom. How are you guys doing? Thanks uh, again for staying up. Good to have you, man. Thank you, thank you, sir. Or actually, you you did get some he, sleep, didn't you? He slept a little. Yeah, yes, so getting yes, up I actually early. did go to sleep this time. He's so, asleep right yes, now. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's start off with those Microsoft Surface uh, price points. Uh, Ten days before they go on sale, you can now pre-order them online. Now, I mentioned all the prices in the news views, but what's confusing when you go to the site, they don't seem to allow you to order the $599 64 gig right now. You can only order the 64 gig with the touch cover. And remember, the touch cover is the one that has a keyboard on it, but it's flat because it's it's like touch typing. And the type cover is the one that has more of a full keyboard on it. Uh, but what do you think of these pricings? 10.6-inch uh, Microsoft Surface running RT, $499 for the 32 gig. Now, that's the same opening price as the iPad. But if I'm not mistaken, is not the iPad a 16 gig at the open, not a 32 gig? Yes, that's right. So you get more storage for the same price. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, Microsoft's won this one. <laughs> Done. <laughs> somebody in the chat room was like, okay, wait, it's $499, same price as the iPad, and it has no apps. That's what the, the, the claim is going to be. I mean, well, the no, thing that's is, not true. I know it's not that's true at all. That's definitely not true. That's why I wanted to bring it up, because the thing is, the development for Metro apps, or whatever they're calling it, modern UI, has been going on for a while. And Microsoft has its own first-party apps that are supposed to be pretty powerful. But, I mean, it's it's definitely some competitive pricing. $499 to, to get it without a cover sounds like a reasonable price, especially if you're looking around and going iPad or am I going to go with a Samsung or why not Microsoft because people kind of know them. What do you make of the, What do you make of the selection, uh, Peter? I know you you do Mac talk, but you you've got to have an opinion on Microsoft Surface. Oh, look, I, I really really want one of these. I think that they they look absolutely gorgeous and um, you know, I'm a big fan of the the Windows uh, a Windows 8 operating system. I've only played with Windows 8 of course, um, briefly with the uh, HTC 8X I got on my hands on the other day. But um, yeah, no, the, I, I think they look gorgeous. I mean, I'm going to first of all try to get my boss to to buy me one. Um, but if that doesn't work, then I I I'll probably will go out and buy one myself. 
Yeah, I think this is these are exactly what Microsoft promised. Steve Ballmer said the pricing will be around the same as what other tablets like this are priced. And that's that's exactly what they're seeing. They've got a little bit of bragging rights because they can say, oh, you get a little more storage. But but that's and that's good. And that's nice. Uh, I like that they give you the option to bundle in that cover for a little bit of a savings over what they would charge you otherwise it's 120 dollars for you to buy it separately so you get it for an extra hundred dollars if you bundle it in that seems nice and that also brings the price back up in line with the ipad and the ipad doesn't include any kind of accessories you got to buy that separately so I, what i think though is that these differences are minor and you're going to make this purchase decision the way microsoft wants you to make this purchase decision on the features on what you think of the operating system and the ecosystem and what you want to work in and microsoft is gambling that people are much more used to using Windows on a desktop, and therefore they might feel very comfortable using this operating system on a tablet. Well, what about all the people, like, I mean, I know you were kind of kidding, but uh, that say, well, there aren't that many apps as compared to what you could run on an iPad. And that's very true. I mean, we have a little bit of a chicken or egg issue here where developers will get excited about creating apps for people if these tablets sell really well, because then you have all these people who are just waiting to download your apps and using them. If they don't sell that well at the offset, then Microsoft has to sort of continue what they've been doing for the last few months, which is convincing companies to make apps for them and trying to convince them that it's worth everybody's while because the customers will come. And that's definitely something that you have to consider when you're looking at the Windows RT version of this. At 499 though, you can get the like the Atom-based ones from other companies. I think Acer and Asus have one or have each a 499 version with the Atom processor, which would allow you not to worry about this app problem because you'll be able to run all the old desktop apps on it. The RT version is obviously very very different. You're going to have a different app experience. So I mean, the fact that they that Microsoft includes, you know, a version of Office, and there's actually a lot of education on the website explaining the difference between RT and 8. It seems like, you know, if you're worried about apps, you probably want to go with the Intel version because you still have all your old applications because the new one, who knows if it'll take off. Looks like Microsoft has an idea of how many they think they'll sell. Wall Street Journal reporting that suppliers saying uh, between three and five million Surface tablets being manufactured for sale this autumn. I also don't know what to make of their television ad. It aired last night during Monday Night Football in advance of the announcement of the pricing uh, and the pre-orders today. And it really was just a bunch of people making clicking sounds. Well, actually, not people making clicking sounds. They're clicking with their Microsoft surfaces because they use the the, the easel to, to pop it out. And then they're they're all swapping their keyboards. That seems like a horrible idea. Germs. Why would you do that? Uh, I'm not sure that this it's convinces me. Does this, does this make this it seem cool okay to have a surface? This is a very OK Go kind that, of a commercial. Yeah, yeah, but you never see what it does. It's just this thing that magnetizes and clicks, and you don't realize it's a computer. It's a full-fledged computer, and this has got a magnet in it. That's the, the gimmick we're going to do right now. I will now. tell you what my unbidden thought was when I watched this this morning was, oh, Microsoft Windows 8 really looks like a great tablet operating system. It makes system. old people kiss. Come on, you guys. <laughs> it does make yeah. old people kiss. <laughs> That's the click. It's old people kissing. If you wanted to know the science behind it, there you go. <laughs> and what you is know, Windows 8. Windows 8 is incredibly pretty, so they're playing to their strength with that ad, I think. You know, the whole point of that is to just show how pretty it is. Yeah, that's fine. I, I think you're right. Because I, I, as as doubtful as I am about the uh, tile interface on my desktop, it looks gorgeous in a tablet setting. And, they, and it does show off to best effect in that ad. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about new tablets possibly coming. Ah. We actually... <laughs> have a fact. Apple yeah. sent out an actual announcement. Yeah, when I was setting up this story this morning, it's like, it's all rumor mill, but turns out this morning, Apple's like, oh yeah, by the way, on the 23rd, we've got a little more to show you. That's their silly little tagline. The little pad. The little little pad. pad that's coming up. I love it. So obviously they haven't expressed what exactly it's going to be. Everyone's guessing the iPad mini, but there's a lot more rumors going on. So I think we should take a look at the rumor mill. If we can. Oh, no, you are going to jump I'm gonna into I'm going to go it. to the rumor mill. That's okay. right. All right. Well, yeah, now that we've got the facts out the of the way. The facts are out of the way. we got to take a ride we, down we have to the, the rumor mill. coming up. We have no idea what's coming other than the fact that we think it's an iPad mini. But all things D says we're getting a 13-inch MacBook Pro with Retina display with 2560 by 600 dis 1600 display. There's supposed to also be a new Mac mini according to 9 to 5 Mac, two configurations, and a third model with OS X server. And there's actually some more details on the iPad mini which does not exist yet. Uh, four different storage uh, options, three different types of connectivity, which would make for 12 different models. You could, pro according to these reports, you could get one with 3G or LTE, but you don't have, you can pick and choose your antennas in there. So it would give you a lot of options to customize your iPad mini. And if you're counting the colors, because it's black and white, there should be 24 options for you if you want to get an iPad <laughs> mini. Uh, let's just 
quickly go around the horn and think, what, what, what's your opinion about this, Sarah? Um, okay, so I know that, you know, this, we're still heavy in the rumor mill right now, but I love the theme. So iPad mini, okay, that's nothing new. Everyone's been talking about it for four years, but now we've also got a smaller MacBook Pro with a retina display. That's sort of like a mini too. And oh yeah, how about the Mac minis? Everybody forgot about those. We didn't. We got new Mac minis too. Little something to show you. I actually think that this makes pretty good sense. Peter, do you think it's all about the little things or are we going to finally see like an iMac <laughs> update? Can we finally see uh, an iMac I update? Like a little processor change? <laughs> Uh, yeah, look, I, I don't really know. I mean, the, the whole idea of the fact that they were, they were doing a separate iPad event was to uh, uh, so that the iPad and the iPhone wouldn't have to share the stage. So I can't really see the iPad baby having to share the stage with other things as well. But I mean, I, I think these, these products are probably going to come out sometime in the next week or so, but um, they might just kind of slip out later. I don't know. I, I thought it made more sense that this focus, uh, the, the event was, sorry, focused on education and textbooks. So I, I thought that rumor made a little bit more sense. A little something more to show you. And we will find out on Tuesday. Tuesday. We're actually going to uh, cover it uh, live. Yeah, yeah, we will. Uh, Tech News Today will be live at 9 a.m. Pacific on Tuesday. Uh, I'm assuming this. I, I haven't got confirmation, but I'm assuming. We'll, we'll move it to 9 a.m. And then at 10 a.m. we'll do the live coverage of the iPad Mini announcement. Oh, or or is whatever it? it is. Who knows? <laughs> uh, and and then we'll, uh, we'll actually put out a... a a final version of Tech News Today that will include a discussion about whatever Apple announces uh, in the final version. So you can watch three different things involving this. But we'll have other news in there as well. So, so definitely can I, can I predict one thing for the event? Sure. Sure. I, I really want to see this ad. I've been waiting like six months for this ad, but I, th I think it's going to be, um, you know, a, a beautiful man sits on a couch and he's, he's got an iPad in front of him and the camera p pans back and there's this beautiful immaculate daughter sitting beside him with a smaller iPad and they're kind of flicking things back and forth to each other and then it just fades out, Apple logo. I think that that's going to be the ad for the iPad baby. I'm actually <laughs> pretty excited about the Are possibility. Are you calling it the iPad baby? <laughs> well, you know... <laughs> Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, I think the little iPad sounds cuter, but whatever. Okay. iPad baby. That's funny. Uh, I was just going to say, I'm actually pretty excited about the possibility of a 13-inch uh, MacBook Pro with Retina. Um, the 15-inch, even though I know that's not a huge computer, just because I've been using a 13-inch MacBook Air for long enough, it's just a little too, ah, it feels too big, even though it looks beautiful. Uh, so I love the idea of having something that's obviously going to be heavier, but certainly more powerful, but the same the same uh, form factor. I'm still waiting on that MacBook Air with Retina. Still waiting. What are you doing? I don't know. I'm trying to figure out how it would give birth. I just don't. I don't want to talk about it's it. The, it's, <laughs> it's, it's because the, it's the 20 it's the minute. Yeah. 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 Will, yeah. The, will the mini have well, the actually, new 30 pin. The baby would be the iPod better, Touch, eh? and the mini would be the one that's a little bigger. <laughs> Confused. Gangly. All right. There's some people throwing up out there because they're tired of all this. So let's talk about RIM. Okay, so... <laughs> That'll make um, everybody better. <laughs> all right, well, there, there is, there's some good news, I think. RIM has said, listen, we're going to uh, go ahead and open up. This is something that they, they had talked about earlier this year. Uh, our very first BlackBerry Tech Center. This is happening at uh, RIM's European headquarters in Slough. That's right. I always want to say Slough, but it's Slough. Uh, that's in the UK. But it's a little bit confusing. So you go, okay, well, you've got a tech center... All right, I'm a BlackBerry developer, enthusiast. I go in, what do I get out of it? Um, they're going to have different themes depending on the day. So you've got Android, iOS, and Windows efforts, uh, dedicated help available for people interested in uh, developing for those on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Fridays. And then Mondays are for Native Cascades QT, and Wednesdays are for WebWorks and HTML5. And, and RIM says, listen, this is just the first of developer tech centers because we're confident about it. Uh, we're going to be opening more Silicon Valley, Vancouver, Indonesia, other places on the way as well. So they're teaching you how to do Android, iOS, and Windows development? I think it's to port your applications over. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Well, that, yeah, that I mean, it's more. it's all sorts of stuff. But yeah, I mean, there's obviously, I mean, if you're looking at their uh, Monday through Friday schedule, there is quite a bit of emphasis on Android and iOS. Now, okay, we've got that. And you say, all right, well, you know, BlackBerry uh, 10, we're, we're not going to see that until next year. And you know, RIM gets beat up a lot. And here they are um, giving back to the developer community and trying to get everybody excited again. And that's all good and fine. Uh, last night, the New York Times runs an article literally about how people are shameful of having BlackBerry devices. Now that, and that's opposite of what it used to be. 
Yes. Uh, it, I mean, in fact, the original art, uh, the original headline of this story um, was something called... Blackberry becomes a source of shame for users. Isn't the URL? Uh, yeah. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now they're calling it the Blackberry is black sheep. But the idea is, is like they have all these quotes from normal people who are using Blackberries on a regular basis. Um, there was a profile of a particular woman who said, I hide my Blackberry under my iPad, you know, if I'm in sales meetings, for fear that clients will see it and judge me. And then another BlackBerry user says, it's not just because he thinks that it's, you know, ugly and it's going to make him seem like he's behind the times. He says, it doesn't work. I want to take a bat to it. You can't do anything with it. You're supposed to, but it's all a big lie. Which sounds like wow. he's maybe just got a really faulty BlackBerry because I think they actually do quite a few things. Uh, another uh, hedge fund marketer said she recently attended a work retreat. Um, at a at an upscale country club in New York, she asked the concierge, oh, "Do you have a phone charger?" And he said, "Sure." Then he saw what kind of phone I had and said, in a disgusted tone, "Oh, no, 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 not for that." And it used to be the opposite. If you had an iPhone first gen and you went to the concierge, he'd be like, "Oh, we would we don't have a charger for that right. flash in the pan phone." And people with their Blackberries would look down on you like, "Well, I have a serious phone." So it's come full circle. It's the opposite. They also have one quote in here that I had to take a little bit of offense with. This uh -huh. comes from a musician who says, Blackberry users are like MySpace users. They probably still chat on AOL Instant Messenger, which I <laughs> do as well. So I don't really see what's so wrong with that. Wow, I mean, Sarah. I'm not using the AOL client itself, but I'm certainly connecting to people who, are, you know, I'm using the same AOL Instant Messenger That's name. why they call it America Online. That I got in 1997 or something. But yeah, I mean, this is like, it's... I'm not sure why the New York Times felt it necessary to just sort of skewer anybody who's still using a BlackBerry and make them feel like, you know, less of a, a tech person. It, it seemed extremely harsh. It, am I the only one? I mean, the, the job is to report the news, right? Like, I know that yeah. I, I have, I, I'm guilty of it. And when I see somebody pull out a BlackBerry phone with a keyboard, I'm like, what do you, what do you have that for? Because they would explain, it does email. I'm like, oh, so does everything else. But apparently... BlackBerry still has the best style of email from from what I've been told. But and their keyboards are supposed to be fantastic. And I'm not a keyboard guy when it comes to those devices anymore. So it just seems like it's, it's a reflection, right? We have this we have a company that has less than five percent of the smartphone market in the United States that used to be dominant and now it's just like they're desperately grasping, trying to figure out, okay, next quarter. We're going to have a phone. It's going to be great. You're going to love us. We have development centers. Keep Stay with us. We have a music video. Please stay. Come stay, to our stay. camps. You will learn many things. Peter, do you look down <laughs> on the BlackBerry at all? I don't. I, I, well, I don't see them anymore. But, I mean, every time I'm on the show, uh, there's a story mocking BlackBerry. And I, I don't know whether that's me or that's BlackBerry. Um, I'm starting to think it's them. But I don't know. I mean, with the announcement from Apple and the announcement from Microsoft today, I think everyone's going to be talking Slough. Ah, <laughs> uh, Slough, the home of the office. Uh, let's take a quick break and uh, thank our other sponsor for today's show, Ford. This episode brought to you by Ford featuring Sync's versatile entertainment features such as browsing your music collection by genre, album, artist, playlist, or song title, all using voice commands because you're like, wait a minute, Tom, browsing while I'm driving my car, that sounds unsafe. Well, it's not with Sync because you're just telling it, hey, what's in my music collection? Show me, uh, play, uh, tell me what's, uh, what rock songs I have, what jazz songs I had. Sync allows voice-activated control of your media player. It'll even play a list of music music you're in the mood for just you start a, a charlie parker song and then you just say play similar music and it finds all the great bebop jazz in your collection listen to your entertainment on most any device voice controlled music no matter how it's stored you got a smartphone you got a blackberry you got a usb drive you got an mp3 player one of those old ipods It'll play it all. Plus, they do iTunes tagging. If you're listening to the radio, you don't have to worry about remembering the song. You're like, wait, okay, I gotta, I want to download that song. You just tell Sync to tag that song. My Ford Touch and HD radio technology lets you tag a song that you like, transfer that info to your iPod, and purchase the song directly from iTunes later when you get home. Best of all, Ford offers Sync on every 2012 and 2013 Ford vehicle. So in the USA, including the 2012 Ford Focus. You can learn more about this and other technologies Ford is bringing to its vehicles at Ford.com slash technology. And we thank them for their support of Tech News Today.
There's a little uh, hiring spree going on. Yahoo's stealing another Googler. Yeah, and it was uh, on Marissa Meyer's uh, first full day back in the office after uh, taking some time off after she had a baby. Uh, She actually tweeted, my first full day back in the office, and I'm excited to kick it off by announcing my new COO. Um, That COO is Henrique DeCastro, and he was most recently vice president of Google's Worldwide Partner Division Solutions Group. Uh, Before that, he'd been with Google for a while, uh, Google's Media, Mobile, and Platforms Organization. Spent two years at Dell. Uh, he managed sales and biz dev there across Western Europe. So it's a, this is a big. I mean, this is this is her first big. Hey, uh, you know, of of the dream team that I'm building at Yahoo. This is probably the biggest. You know, hire uh, by far for her. It's a somewhat of a crazy salary. You know, he's he's got six hundred thousand uh, yearly base salary, but then there's bonuses, thirty six million in stock grants and equity awards and what's interesting is that he is walking away from some potential cash at Google. Uh, so Yahoo also has a 1 million make whole cash um, you know, sort of to incentivize him to come on over. $20 million in stock to replace his Google shares. Uh, those will vest over the next four years. Uh, Kara Swisher over at All Things D says there might be a little a little clashy clash going on at Yahoo, though, because the current head of revenue is Michael Barrett. Meyer didn't hire him. Uh, interim CEO Ross Levinson did this summer before uh, before she h- arrived. Sources say DeCastro and Barrett worked together at Google, and they didn't get along. They didn't get along so well. No, Barrett has said publicly, even though Meyer didn't hire me, I plan to stay. Not everybody feels that way. Some sources within Yahoo seem to think that he's not long for the company. Um, So it remains to be seen how things will change under DeCastro. But I think it is significant that, I I mean, uh, Meyer's going full steam ahead, um, as she said she would. And it looks like we're, you know, probably going to see a much better indication of how she is staffing her highest executives by the end of the year. Yeah, I, I think it's significant that she got a high-level Googler. It's hard to get people away from Google. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and Especially to Yahoo. Especially to a place like Yahoo. But I think Marissa has sort of, she's first of all, she, she can overcome that because she's a former Googler, so she knows how to counter those yeah. objections. And she can overcome the, the hesitancy of Yahoo because she's talking about all of the things she's doing to remake Yahoo and make it more of an attractive place to work. I wonder if this kind of hire shows a bit of like dissatisfaction with, with the movement with Google because they used to be very simple when Meyer was there. Things have shifted a lot. We're seeing a lot more integration with, I believe, like your Google Drive results now show up in your Google searches if you're part of this. Do you think BFL. that affects the COO though? I'm thinking that this this is part of a larger movement because when, when, there was all these stories about Larry Page pushing for things to be very different. And so if there's enough dissatisfaction at the top level, even at Google, this kind of thing could keep happening. And that would mean that Yahoo, theoretically, would might be a much simpler style uh, search engine than it used than it used to be. So it might just be like almost Yahoo would turn into the old Google. Google would continue doing whatever the heck it's doing with social, and maybe it could be attractive to people because that's one of the things that people loved about Google: simplicity. What do you think, Peter? Is it is it the simplification, the focus that Larry Page is putting on things it, that might be uh, making some people look for elsewhere to go, or, or is this just an isolated incident? I think that's a great theory. I mean, I'd love to see... I love watching what's happening over at Yahoo. It's, it seems like Yahoo had that same kind of stink that um, MySpace and, and BlackBerry had. Um, and, yeah, Maurice is really kind of shaking off that stink. So um, it's just really fascinating, and it's always great to have uh, competition in, in search. Absolutely. Marissa smells very good. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's talk about Boxy TV, offering unlimited DVR storage, dual tuners, and Netflix... Or $99, but you also have to pay a subscription fee? There's a subscription fee because there's no onboard storage in this boxy TV set-top box, which does not have that weird, like, angular style. It's a regular rectangular box like we saw last week. Now, the DVR is going to work with almost any speed connection, but the uh, the head of Boxy, Abner Ronan, says, recommends a minimum of 2 megabits uh, uh, two megabits up and 5 megabits down. I would, get, I would say so. Yeah, to get the <laughs> best being quality. Even a little conservative. Because man. the DVR is going to have 2 to 4 megabit streams. So you're going to have to make sure that you're paying $15 a month to have access to that. But then again, since everything's in the cloud, when you have your Boxy app, you should be able to watch your recordings on your phone or your tablet without having to worry about converting or finding the files. Uh, the set-top box with these dual tuners can uh, pull over-the-air HD, HD TV signals, unencrypted cable signals, if you still have that. 
Uh, and apparently, there's some trade-offs with the Boxy TV because it's not supposed to be a replacement for the Boxy Box. The Boxy TV is made by geeks for people, which means it doesn't support as many file types, so it's not going to be like like VLC style playback. Uh, it it uh, doesn't have as many apps, and the major app that's missing is there's no web browser on the Boxy TV. It does have Netflix, Vudu, Pandora, YouTube, Spotify. So a lot of that's this is in like there. this is like a combination of a Roku and Simple TV. Simple TV is an over-the-air DVR that actually uses a Roku app for you to view it. And Roku says, "We know we don't have a browser. We just have a bunch of channels that you can add." And Simple TV though will take advantage of a hard drive you have uh, locally. But so this is a slight difference of this cloud DVR system, which would give Boxy a nice little revenue stream. Uh, I'm guess I think some people were upset that Boxy TV takes away some of the functionality that Boxy Box had. Well, it doesn't take it away. It's an entirely separate product. Right. Boxy Box still exists. It's yeah. not discontinued, so people shouldn't freak out about that. But I'm kind of curious about what people think about this cloud DVR option because I know when I record things to get it from place to place, it's kind of a pain. So to actually have this recorded in one area and I could go find that. Uh, that'd be great. Oh, by the way, again, the limited markets. When you say record it in one area and you can go find that, what do you mean? You, you mean you, you record it? He means like it. he's got it on a hard drive in his living room, and mm -hmm. then he's like, I really want to watch what I recorded in my bedroom, and then I have to figure out how to get that file and convert it through over. my and network somewhere. You don't have to do that with Boxy. Shouldn't TV. have to do that. Oh, by the way, that cloud DVR is limited. New York, L.A., Dallas, Atlanta, Houston, and D.C. So you're not recording these locally. You're recording them to Boxy's service. That's right. So and that's Boxy why you got to pay $15 a month. Right, because you want access. Why do you think that the cloud DVR service, because I looked at this and thought, yay, I'm so excited for Boxy TV. This is perfect for me because all I really, you know, don't have as far as my OTA antenna is the ability to DVR anything and certainly not to be able to DVR two things at once. That's cool. But I can't get it. Why wouldn't cloud DV? I mean, is it just because they're not sure how, like, their server infrastructure is going to I would be taxed? Think, I would think that's it, is they want to start with a nice big markets so they yeah. can sell a lot of these, but mm -hmm. but the ability to kind of say, okay, let's let's hold on and, and limit the, the influx to the server, because yeah. running that data center, that's expensive, and you don't want it to go down. You want people to have a good experience. Yeah, and this is different than Aereo. It's not like that... You're not renting an antenna. This is actually your antenna attached to this box, yeah. which is sending the recording upstream. So you better have a good connection, which I sometimes, I'm, it's that's, not a number you normally look at. People are like, oh, it's 25 down. That's great. What's how much up? up? Yeah. And how consistent is that? Because if your recording quality dips, even though it's being recorded to four megabits, you're probably going to be seeing this horribly pixelated thing. Well, is it recording it up there or is it recording it locally and uploading it? As far that's as I know, it looks like it's recording so it on is, their sends servers. It directly so it up does there. have a All bit right. of a delay. Peter, what do you make of this? Uh, look, it, it looks like a really, really sexy box, but um, I, I mean, we're never going to get the uh, DVR feature in Australia. I can guarantee that. So um, I'm not as excited. I don't know. I mean, why won't if, you get it I in Australia? Uh, I just I, look. The boxy box um, has only been out for a little while here, anyway. Um, if, if they're launching in uh, select markets in America, then they it's going to take at least two, three years before they bother to to select our market. So um, yeah, I wouldn't hold my breath for that. But I don't know. I mean, I, I really love I love uh, the Xbox Media Center that this is uh, based on. I, I prefer the Plex interface. I think that's gorgeous. But yeah, I mean, this looks like a great device if if you are in one of those cities. All right, let's uh, finish up with the story of another DMCA takedown gone horribly wrong. Uh, this one starts in, is actually in your backyard, uh, Peter. Edublogs <laughs> yes. is an Australian company. So Edublogs is an Australian company that allows teachers to make blogs. It's kind of like a blogging platform, but it's, it's got a niche market because it's ta tailored to teachers. Uh, and a teacher created a blog post apparently back in 2007 as part of a lesson plan related to suicide and self-harm, reprinting... Beck's Hopelessness Scale, which is a 20-item self-evaluation questionnaire published in 1974, which Pearson Publishing has the rights to and sells for $120. Pearson, in their enforcement uh, observation, finally came across this, sent a digital millennium copyright notice to Server Beach, which hosts EduBlog. Server Beach is a U.S. company, so of course, Everything hosted on Server Beach falls under the DMCA here in the U.S. Server Beach forwarded that notice on September 26th to EduBlogs, and EduBlogs resolved it within 24 hours. So far, so good. Then, Server Beach says they received a second notice from Pearson on October 8th. They sent that to EduBlogs, and it was not responded to. So they sent another notice on October 9th. That one was also not responded to. Why was that? Server Beach says the file was still accessible 
Edublog says the file was temporarily in the web server's varnish cache. That's that's a, a cache that's used to help speed up the serving of pages. So it might have been accessible to some users, but it certainly wasn't directly accessible, and it had been removed from the blog. On October 10th, last Wednesday, ServerBeach took action that caused the Edublog servers to go offline for about 60 minutes. This is in the middle of the night. Peter, you're you're very uh, well aware of what that feels like, I know. <laughs> uh, for about 60 minutes, they're scrambling, trying to get ServerBeach to resolve this, uh, along with all 1.45 million blogs on Edublog's offline. Now, ServerBeach says the reason all, all of the blogs went offline is they don't have a way into their customers' websites to take down a particular page. So they did what they could, which was to block a script, and that ended up cascading and, and failing the entire EduBlog service. Uh, on the line to, to discuss sort of the legal ramifications of this, we have Evan Brown from This Week in Law. Evan, thanks for joining us. Hey, Tim. It's great, great to see you. Tom, how's it going? Good to see you. You know, whatever. You know, you know my mom just, does that all the time. My brother's name's Tim. I'm just dropping in from, from you know, outer space somewhere. So great to see you, Tom. It's great to be on the show. So I noticed you uh, you were quoted in the Ars Technica article about this, calling it ham-fisted. It seems like, you know, basically Pearson is following the DMCA and Server Blogs is, is following a very strict interpretation, saying, look, we, we sent the notice along. It wasn't taken down. We had to take action. Well, yeah. I mean, the DMCA, as you know, it's it's this uh, it's this balancing uh, framework that was established back in the late '90s. President Clinton signed the signed the law, and back then it was it was much different uh, kind of framework than what we're dealing with now. But you know, it's it's ha it was ham fisted in this situation because we were talking about a, a blog platform, a blog network, if you will, one and a half million blogs. You know, that's great for headlines, great for sensationalism. Here, over one piece of content, it was taken down. So I hear what. Server Beach is saying, yeah, they may not have had access, you know, right into the particular piece of content, but that's that's a problem, isn't it? Because if it's going to be uh, over this one piece of content, it's way out of proportion, and that's where I, I came up with the term or decided to use the term "ham-fisted." Taking this down is just grossly out of proportion uh, to the to the problem that was being presented here, and so it's uh, it's a situation where the DMCA was used in a way that was uh, just not just not right. Now I've seen some people say that. Server blogs didn't, or Server Beach didn't have to take down the script. That what they could have done is just block the particular URL that Pearson referred to. And while that may have not caused every possible instance of this file to be blocked, it would have complied with the notice. Do, do you think that's true? Well, I mean, all the DMCA requires is that uh, either the content be deleted or access to it disabled. So, you know, it's uh, who, only God knows what the actual technical answer to all that is. But if the if the content was no longer available to web users, especially through the link that was there, that seems to me to be compliance with the DMCA because, you know, it's it's the remedy that, that Pearson uh, wanted in all this. And, you know, I think a really important point in here is the the flimsiness of Pearson's claim to begin with. I've actually represented some clients who have gotten, uh, you know, nasty letters from Pearson claiming copyright in content uh, actually involving uh, Beck, the psychologist or the psychotherapist or whomever he was. Uh, maybe he's still around. But these are just very fact, uh, you know, like checklists. And it's it's kind of puzzling that Pearson is so aggressive in uh, enforcing these anyway. So that's another point to underscore the the disproportionate response by you know taking down this whole network over one piece of content. Well, I can understand why they sell a twenty item checklist for one hundred twenty dollars. Uh, well, if they could make that much money off a twenty item checklist, they're going to be pretty vicious about defending it, I guess. Well, that's a that, and that that same kind of rationale could go to Server Beach. It's my understanding that uh, Edu Blogs was what a seventy five thousand plus year Correct. customer of Server Beach. All Server Beach uh, was at risk here was being uh, you know losing a defense it may have had in a copyright infringement act by complying with the DMCA. So to me, there was not only um, you know some some problems by not having the technological ability to get in and take this particular piece of content off. It was it was a big bigger business decision uh, that that was a bad decision if you're looking at uh, how to treat a customer in this type of situation. And, so, and, and to give Server Beach credit, they have actually responded to the blog post from the head of EduBlog saying, we really value as a customer. We hope we can figure out how to resolve this. You know, not exactly saying I'm sorry per se, but but trying to, to make amends. 
it sounds to me from what you're saying, Evan, is that Server Beach looked at the DMCA and and said, well, it says if we if we know it's available and and got really strictly interpretive about that and said, well, we know it's in the cache and that makes it available. And even if that means almost nobody can find it, it's available. And in court, if we say, well, we knew it was available, we lose. You know, that's really interesting. Um, I mean, Server Beach, first of all, uh, well, I, I guess at the fundamental level, that is just a really, really, really conservative yeah. reading of the DMCA. And I don't know why Server Beach acting reasonably would do that. Here's another important point about the DMCA. And this is a point I love to stress because I think it's very often misunderstood. Um, if, a, if a web platform like a hosting company or any kind of intermediary that's hosting user generated content decides not to comply with the DMCA takedown request, that does not mean automatically that they are responsible for that infringement. And if they got sued, that they would be liable and have to pay, you know, $150,000 worth of statutory damages. All that means is that they would not be afforded the defense that the DMCA gives them. You know, if they got sued and they have complied with the DMCA takedown regimen, all they have to do is say, judge, look, we complied with the DMCA. You got to throw this case out. And the judge has to throw the case out. If they just ignore DMCA uh, uh, takedown requests, the plaintiff, you know, in this situation, Pearson would still have to plead and prove that the, the intermediary, the hosting company was secondarily liable for copyright infringement. And that is by no means always an open and shut case. So there's yet another reason why Server Beach could have, uh, you know, gone differently in in this situation and, and been just fine. It, it certainly seems to me uh, like Server Beach overreacted uh, out of a uh, what is a culture of fear about copyright, uh, and uh, and I'm I'm not say, I'm not excusing them when I say that, but this is this is not surprising in a way that we see these kinds of reactions. We see them from algorithms all the time in other situations like YouTube. They're just built into the system. This one happened to have humans involved. Right. And if you want to talk about fear, this is a perfect entree into the obvious implications from this discussion that, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing these types of things. And, and granted, things were not done correctly uh, under the DMCA here. And you can assign blame and, and, you know, reason it out however you want in all the analysis here. But what is really scary, the natural implications uh, from this is that if there ever is a system like SOPA or PIPA that is that actually becomes law and that becomes the framework for handling infringements, you would see all kinds of situations like this where entire blocks of the internet are taken down. And that's the fundamental complaint that people had about SOPA and PIPA. And, you know, if this is, uh, is if this is, uh, you know, uh, disconcerting, uh, there's a, it's a perfect example of why we just cannot let SOPA or PIPA ever become law. Evan, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to drop in and, and help us understand what is a really complex issue. Really appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Tom. Great to uh, great to be on the show. Excellent. Evan Brown, you can catch him uh, every Friday at twit.tv slash twill uh, or, or live at live.twit.tv on This Week in Law with Denise Howell. Thanks again, Evan. Right on. Thank you. Talk to you later. Let's move on to the randomizer. Randomizer. Turns out 19th century French artists predicted all of this. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Even this podcast episode. Exactly. There's a postcard for this, uh, one for this episode. <laughs> and it even but. says tech news today. What is going on here? Singularityhub.com has a bunch of uh, postcards up uh, that were commissioned in the 19th century uh, by, uh, by uh, who was it by? I don't it's remember. either by a toy or cigarette manufacturer. Okay. The, the documents are, they say both. Uh, same thing. Kind of a collective. Well, a toy and cigarette <laughs> manufacturers. Not, not and, or. It's, there's contradictory evidence. Back then, it was a different time. <laughs> uh, These are great. Baseball cards were in tobacco <laughs> products, back, right? Anyway, so over 100 years ago, some French artists tried to envision what our world would look like and they didn't get too far off apparently these were never released though which is really sad uh but they show a guy uh you know talking on on a on a telephone uh you know o over long distance they they show some projections uh people doing video calls with ladies in big victorian dresses uh which we do every day they're very steampunky uh, you know, because they're from that era. Uh, but, you know, microscope projections of, of the small animalcules. Of the tiny little dragons. <laughs> that live in our bloodstream. <laughs> uh, these are these are really fascinating. The, they're, they're, they're so wrong, but yet 
in a way, yeah, our our predilection is to find patterns where there may not be patterns, but they they look terribly close. Lots of robots in these things. I mean, that's how our present is like is formed, right? We have all these works of science fiction. We're like, that'd be really cool. Why not make it work that way? And one of the postcards shows it's actually voice dictation. The guy's talking into like a, into a horn or whatever it looks like, and there's a little typewriter. Now it's a bit strange that you need. This kind of conglomeration of of, uh, of mechanisms. Oh, that's voice to do recognition. It. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the thing is, it, it looks like a telephone. It's like, but yeah, we kind of made that all work into a little handheld device. So it, it's not so far off. Although I think one of them is to replace your fireplace with radium or something. So like, it might have killed you. So not not every one of We're these. We're just not there yet. <laughs> great the, option. The one with the guy uh, flying on his personal flying machine and delivering some mail uh, is is one of my favorites because that could be. Totally true, but it's not yet. Like we haven't even gotten there yet. Keep keep going, keep uh, going Jason. It's, yeah, it's a little yeah. farther down. Look for the zeppelins. Uh, there you go. There yeah. we go. Looks a bit like a Da Vinci's uh, influence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Flyer there for sure. <laughs> I don't know, you guys. I mean, I'm looking at these. I'm like, no, this isn't really like modern life at all. <laughs> I wish modern life was. Like I that. I don't. Your yeah. mailman doesn't I, fly up to your apartment <laughs> instead of going well, to give Pete, all the way downstairs. Pete, Peter lives in the future. It's already tomorrow where oh, he still? is. Oh, that's true. Indeed, indeed. I, I love the one with the uh, there's kind of a meat grinder that uh, they're putting textbooks into and they're all getting fed into the kids' uh, heads. That's that's great. That should be um actually album art because they're all wearing headphones. So yeah, that could be album <laughs> art for the show. That's either audiobooks or it's the Matrix. So that's the actually Matrix. what the publishing industry thinks is going on with ebooks. Well, yeah, that, I guess what, so. That's what Google's doing with their book scanning That's project. a takedown waiting to happen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, let's take a uh, quick break and thank Gazelle for sponsoring this show. Couldn't do it without you, Gazelle. You want that new iPhone? You want that new Microsoft Surface? You want some money for your gadgets? Sell your old gear. You got something sitting around, old iPod, old MacBook, laptop, Android phone, or even just you want to straight up trade your current iPhone for the new iPhone. Gazelle is simple. And fast. If you don't want the hassle of selling something, this is the way to go. You go to Gazelle, G A Z E L L E dot com. They tell Gazelle what device you have. Be honest about the condition. First of all, they're going to check it, but you'd be surprised what they'll pay for something that you might think, oh, they're not going to buy that. They, they'll they'll buy some stuff that's even broken sometimes, depending. Uh, so be honest. Tell them what they what your condition is and get the offer. Then you can got 30 days to decide whether to sell it to them or not. They lock in that offer for 30 days, which is a good thing. Because your gadgets probably aren't going to get more valuable over time. So go there, gazelle.com. Find out what your gadget is worth, even if you're not sure you want to sell it. You know, kind of play this game. See see well, how much money you can get. You might be surprised. And then when you do decide to sell it, you print out the shipping label for free. Or even sometimes they'll send you a box. You send it off to Gazelle. They'll pay you by check or PayPal. Uh, and you get paid fast within a couple of days of them receiving your gadget. Gazelle.com. We really thank them for their support of Tech News Today. And now we thank Sarah Lane for telling us what's coming up on the calendar. Well, don't thank me yet. Actually, no, you can go ahead and thank me. Right, thank you, every day. Thank Gadget you. Live is coming back to Boston. Uh, they will be there uh, tomorrow, October so. 17th. No, that's Cali. Never mind. I don't think so. I'm going back to Boston. Oh, yeah. No, it doesn't really work. No. They're going to have a big tea party or something. Google Wallet, we've told you, as get political. was phasing out their prepaid card. Uh, the cutoff date is indeed tomorrow, October 17th. Uh, also tomorrow, October 17th, eBay's earnings will be live, live in Boston. No, they're actually just going to be. Um, announced. Uh, the Dublin Wedge Summit starts tomorrow as well. It runs through Thursday in Dublin, Ireland. Ireland. And finally, the Samsung Galaxy Note 2 is coming to Sprint October 25th, looking ahead a little bit for $299.99. Excellent. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. Why, it's an email. This email comes from Taco in Japan. It says, I'm based in Japan. I've been a listener of the show for some time. Rather rare that you guys discuss topics related to Japan. When Tom kicked off the show with the story of SoftBank's acquisition of Sprint last Thursday, made me realize the magnitude of the story. I personally believe end users of both Sprint and SoftBank Mobile are in the position to gain here. They'll be able to leverage their size to get better deals from device makers, such as Apple, but also from mobile vendors like Ericsson and NSN. I happen to be working for one of the smaller vendors for SoftBank Mobile, and I know they spend billions of dollars each year with these vendors in order to improve and maintain their network. With 4G becoming more and more standard, the cost is only expected to rise in the foreseeable future. Their combined presence in the U.S. and Japan will allow them to invest more efficiently in their infrastructure, which generally is a good thing, not just for the carriers, but for the 
customers, too. It is general consensus among Japanese people that SoftBank still has the worst reception <laughs> of the top three carriers here in Japan, NTT, Docomo, KDDI, and SoftBank. So they have their share of network improvement to do themselves. I think we can expect good things for both SoftBank and Sprint. Thanks for the Japanese perspective on that. That was really cool. Got another email from Neil uh, who says, Sunday, like 8 million others, I too uh, saw the links for Felix Baumgartner on social media, so I checked out the stream on my iPhone. Then I thought it'd be cool to put it in my living room TV so that my family and I could watch. I fired up the built-in YouTube app on my Panasonic TV. Besides the slow interface, I couldn't figure out a way to get the live stream on YouTube, so I fired up my PS3 web browser. I entered the Red Bull URL. The PS3 took me to the download page for their YouTube app. And then I had the same problem. All these setup apps are mostly designed to let you watch featured clips. Doing search just brings up user video postings on the space jumps. Not what I was looking for. Finally, I went to my Windows 7 Media Center PC, and even that required a flash install. <laughs> oh, before man. I was able to get it on my TV in full screen, that was 35 minutes later. Yes, I know if I had an Apple TV, I could have just airplayed it, but I don't. And I'm not sure I would have wanted my phone tied up for an hour while the balloon capsule you know, went up, uh, you know, however many more feet. I can't help but think if this is complicated for me, we have a long way to go before the average user out there can enjoy all these tech advances. Yeah, good point, Neil. I was having a hard time finding it. And even when I knew it was on YouTube, I went to the Apple TV YouTube app. Same problem. It's like a lot of featured stuff, but nothing live. I went through the same. I didn't even I try. Like, like Roku? No. Uh, Apple TV? Yeah. Oh, PC. It's attached. And then I, I did have flash installed. So I was like, oh, I can put this full screen. Mm -hmm. As long as you have a PC and you're willing to do the work, I guess you could do it. But Did, did you watch it, Peter? Oh, I, I still haven't gotten around to watching it yet. Oh. Um, I guess I'm, yeah, I know. I, I fail at being a nerd. But uh, I, I did hear that uh, Red Bull actually these days make more money now on their events like this than they actually do selling drinks, which I find fascinating. But um, yeah, there you go. How do they make their money on the event? Um, just from the, the sponsorships that they have for their, their Red Bull, uh, so they've, they've got that kind of Formula One for planes thing. I don't know. It, it was a, it was part of a marketing uh, yeah. discussion at South by Southwest this year. Very cool. Well, that's it for this episode of Tech News Today. Thanks for everybody in our subreddit, especially the moderators for keeping it clean in there. Technewstoday.reddit.com helps us figure out what stories we're going to talk about each day. So if you're a viewer and you're like, I would like them to talk about different things, Go make your voice be heard at technewstoday.reddit.com. Peter Wells, always a pleasure, my friend. Uh, tell folks all about Mac Talk, where they can find it, and all the other stuff you're doing online. Okay, yeah. Uh, so MacTalk.com.au has just had uh, a, an update that's taken about two months or so, a redesign. So we're no longer the ugliest site on the internet. So please go check it out if you want um, a pretty down-to-earth uh, Mac forum to hang out in. And we will be back tomorrow with an all-new episode. You can find us anytime you want, though. We're always with you at twit.tv slash TNT, like a little guardian angel of tech news. Uh, you can also commune with us at 260-TNT-SHOW over the phone or by electronic mail, tw uh, TNT at twit.tv. Tomorrow, Will Harris descends from the heavens to join us. We'll see you then.